everybody. Welcome to the Everywhere Book Fest. Um, you are watching Dinosaurs, Ghosts, and Gods Oh My. It's a middle grade panel. Uh, before we get started, just want to thank our ASL interpreter, Brian Truitt, for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> um, and um, now, oh, also, if you guys have any questions for us, you can leave them in the comments and we're gonna be answering those at the end. So just leave all your questions throughout the chat, um, throughout the uh, panel and that's fine. We'll find them afterwards. Um, so we want to just start with introducing ourselves. You guys okay with that? Yeah? All right, so I'll go first. I'm Clarabel A. Ortega. I'm the author of Ghost Squad. It just came out April 7th and it's a paranormal spooky middle grade that's like Coco meets Stranger Things and it's based on Dominican folklore. <laughs> Kwame, go ahead. Okay, my, dog, five, my dogs are barking, so you go. Okay, okay. <laughs> my name is Kwame Mbalia. I am the author of Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky. Uh, came out last October. Uh, about African American folk tales and the West African mythology, and a young African American boy who is caught between them both. My name is Daniel Jose. I can't do this backwards. My name is Daniel Jose Olden, <laughs> and uh, I wrote Dactyl Hill Squad, which is a story about Magdalisa Roca, who lives in 1863 in Brooklyn, which means it's during the Civil War, and there's dinosaurs running around which isn't really true. That wasn't happening during the Civil War. But in this fantasy book, it is. And Magdalise Roca can uh, talk to dinosaurs with her mind, and they do what she wants them to do, which means that she can become the greatest dinosaur writer in the world and maybe change the course of the Civil War. Um, so that was book one. Book two and three, oh, that's book three. Book two uh, came out. <laughs> book three is about to come out in June. I also want to say real quick before we go on, you two are some of my favorite middle grade authors. Oh, yay. Thank you guys you. are so <laughs> amazing. Like, I, being on this panel is an honor. Like, these two books over here are so good. I just finished Ghost Squad last night. I stayed up all hours reading it because it's so no. good. I did. I did. I'm tired because of you, Cloudy Beth. It's a beautiful book. It's, it's like funny. There's, there's warmth and depth to it. It's an adventure. Tristan Strong is an amazing book, Kwame. I've told you this before, but I need y'all to understand how epic and gigantic and important these books are because they're so good. I'm just proud to be a writer at the same time as you guys. Oh my God, I'm blushing. Thanks. I, just, I just had to start out by saying Thanks that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> because we're not always that good at upping our own stuff, but sometimes, you know, it's important that we do it for each other, but genuinely like- Kwame's crying. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Everybody go home. <laughs> thank you, um, thank you, Dave. I'm the same. Um, okay, so the, yeah. we don't technically have a moderator. Um, so this is like a Wild West panel, but I have a one question to like get us started. Um, and then we can just go from there. So my question is, uh, what magic myth or fantastical elements did you include in your books and why? And the why can be like the storytelling aspect. It could be like the inspiration behind why you included it in your story, um, whatever you would like it to be. So. Kwame, do you want to go first? Um, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I would say, well, starting with what? What um, magic or myths did uh, I include? Um, like, you have to, I feel like I have to start with Anansi. Like, Anansi is just like, um, well, one of his stories, the stories of the story box, it's one of those origin stories of how stories came to the world, you know, every culture kind of has that myth, that tale. And I feel like um, part of this book, uh, part of Tristan Strong revolves around that story, the idea of the story box, the idea of who gets to carry, who gets to tell and who gets to share those stories. And so the magic in this book, in this world, revolves around stories, revolves around the act of telling, revolves around the act of showing, um, and revolves around the act of including those stories um, and including people in those stories. Uh, inclusion is probably one of the most powerful forms of magic in general, um, whether that is, you know, pretend or something you do every day by writing, 
you know, people who might not have been in the book into your stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think storytelling is magic in and of itself, something that we do. Uh, and I think focusing, giving Tristan the power to create and show these stories for everyone to enjoy, I think that's that's probably the most central magic in this book. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I love that part about the book too. Um, for me, it was, uh, it was so <clears throat> there's there's sort of a two parts to the magic, right? I, I love reading history, but I didn't love the idea of writing just a straightforward history story, even historical fiction. For me, like as a fantasy writer, the story really came to life when I was uh, researching and I came across these this group of real life uh, Cuban sisters who were left in an orphanage in the 1860s. And, and I was like, whoa, like I had just, it hadn't occurred to me that there were Cubans in New York back then, but of course there were. Um, and as a Cuban, I was like, whoa, you know, it's, it, whoa, <laughs> like we were there, we, you know? And then I was like, what if they could ride pterodactyls? And like, <laughs> obviously, you know. So for me, like that was the moment that the story really, pun intended, took off. And like, and then I got excited about it. And then, and then it, obviously the next question is like, would, if there were pterodactyls at that time, would they have fought in the civil war, you know, as war beasts? And of course they would have along with triceratops and everything else. So then it got really exciting for me. And, I, and that's kind of what opened up the whole world. The other piece though is Magdalise ha has this magical connection to the dinosaurs. And that mm -hmm. really comes directly from when I was a kid and my parents made the mistake of bringing me to a llama farm. And I was like <laughs> obsessed with llamas instantly. The second I saw them, I was like, you can have llamas? <laughs> and I was just <laughs> I was like staring at them, like wondering if they could hear my thoughts. I know you have all had this experience. Don't act like I'm the only one that wondered if I could talk to llamas as a child. Whatever. When I do school visits and I'm like, hey, you guys wanted to talk to llamas as kids. There's at least like a hand or two, you know. Anyway, the point is, I was so like fascinated by them that I leaned my head forward and I and against the fence, but it was it turned out an electric fence. So then I like woke up like 10 feet back. It was like, <laughs> literally like a cartoon. So that is basically my super villain origin story. <laughs> and also why I wrote Back to Hill Square. What just happened? That, okay, so. <laughs> is anyone surprised by that really, if you think about it? I feel like I was gonna ask you like, how did you make the jump to dinosaurs? But I feel like now I know. <laughs> it was the fence. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, electric and snap. <laughs> Not there. Um, uh, what about you, Claudia? Uh, so in um, Ghost Squad, there's a lot of, you know, sort of magic that's not explained, but I guess the, the main folklore is the fireflies. And the fireflies mm. are actually a Dominican folklore that sa says the souls of your lost loved ones are watching over you as fireflies. Um, and so Glow Squad was inspired by me losing my brother. And I thought it would be a really um, interesting way to talk about grief and loss if the main character had her, all of her ancestors sort of still living with her in her house as these fireflies. Um, and she didn't really ever have to let go, but I, I wanted to show that it's the same for us, even if it's not as um, tangible because mm -hmm. the people that we lose are always with us. And I just wanted to, sort of open that conversation and also include that folklore in a story because I had never read it anywhere, you know? And I think it's important to try to preserve those things, especially for Caribbean folklore is like, mm -hmm. Dominican especially, like it's very hard for you to trace anything or find anything that's not word of mouth. And um, I just put my own spin on it. And I learned about it when I was older. I used to catch fireflies with my brother who I lost when I was younger though. So it really felt like a mm. full circle moment tribute to him also way to share this like beautiful part of my culture and a way that really can help you heal from grief. Cause mm. now I see a firefly and I'm just like, it warms my heart. Mm. I feel mm. like less alone. And I hope that kids who are going through um, any sort of loss feel the same way you know they have this like comforting thing now that's part of nature so yeah that was for me and ghost squad that that's was something um about your book that really like felt like home to me in that in that because uh, when i started you know my first book is shadow shaper right and mm -hmm. and that well my first YA, and you know something that i went into shadow shaper really intentionally trying to do was not demonize ghosts any more than we already do or the dead mm -hmm. you know because like mm -hmm. it's so prevalent that we just like basically except for like harry potter 
and his parents, uh, spoiler, and like Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, like ghosts are basically <laughs> bad in the yeah. Western canon with very few yeah. exceptions. And, you know, that's not true for a lot of us. You know, I know like Latinx families are very often, not always, but very often like we honor our dead, you know, and we're not mm -hmm. scared of them. And that's how I was raised and that's my understanding now. And um, I wanted a mythology and a, a folklore in a book, in a fantasy book that, that spoke to that and where the ancestors are literally holding up, you know, Sierra, like carrying her and, and helping her get through because I know my ancestors helped me to get here and to be the writer mm -hmm. I am and everything else. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, because I think we all write with certain elements of counter narrative too. Mm -hmm. And, but also like, we don't want to let the counter narrative kind of overtake the story and become the whole story. And like, so my question is kind of, what were y'all thinking about in terms of what you were writing against a little bit, but also how did you transform that into what you were writing for, if that makes sense? Or were you? Um, Clarabelle, you wanna go first or you have an answer? Or? Um, I'm sort of thinking. Okay, so for me, I mean, there's, um, I always feel like I'm, I'm, by us writing in general, we're already writing against, we're already writing a counter narrative, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but to, but for, spe for, for specifics, um, for me at least, it always starts with um, who the character is and what he or she or they looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so Tristan is um, a very brown skinned, uh, dark brown skinned, curly haired, a boy wearing a hoodie, right? Um, because various aspects of that persona were, uh, as you said, in referring to something else, were demonized. Um, uh, I tell the story every time I go into a school visit and I see all of you know the seventh and eighth graders, uh, girls and boys uh, wearing hoodies, you know, and I say, you know, I couldn't go into, you know, two of you were only be allowed in the corner store. Mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up, right? And so mm -hmm. it was very important for me on the cover and in the book mm -hmm. um, for Tristan to be wearing a hoodie. Like yeah. that was his thing, that was his source of comfort, that was his source of power, uh, not his source of power, but his his strength. Like he, you know, everyone has that comfort yeah. you know, piece of clothing that you wear and it's just like, I feel good both about myself and about how others see me right now. And that for, for Tristan was um, his hoodie. Uh, and then, you know, just writing about, um, something, uh, a, a representation of the Middle Passage, mm. uh, which I don't know how it, or if it's being taught in schools today. Right. Um, writing something that, that doesn't, as you said, Daniel, that doesn't um, beat you over the head with history, but instead slips you little notes like, hey, maybe you wanna check this out, maybe you wanna check that out. Right. Um, both to readers and, you know, to students, children, adults, to teachers, so that everyone can kind of get a grasp and they can work it into lesson plans or they can just learn something. One of the best feelings I get is when I read a book and I'm like, what is that? And I go off and I read about it and I'm like, oh, it's a real thing. Yes, like, I love that, that too. That yes. is such an incredible feeling for me as a reader. And I just want to provide that for yeah. the people in the book. Yeah. That's my favorite thing with reading also when there's something that I can look up and just learn a whole bunch of new things, especially when it's historical. It's my fave. Um, so for me, I uh, one of the big inspirations behind Ghost Squad was like all of the 80s adventure, like kid movies that I watched that really felt like a fantasy to me because I grew up in the inner city. I wasn't allowed to like ride my bike like far away with my friends. <laughs> like I could never do that. It was just not allowed. So especially with like the Goonies, I grew up with that and I wanted to write something that was like the Goonies, but with like brown and black kids in it, mm -hmm. having adventures on bikes and like Kwame, I really wanted, um, was hoping that they would put the girls on bikes on the cover. Cause that was like really important. Um, even with things like stranger things, like you see uh, these kids going on bikes, but they're usually, you know, like white boys. And like later on, like there is like one black kid and then they ha add like the two girls later on, but it's usually like majority of white kids. Right. And they're, going somewhere and they're having this fun. And I was like, how come I never see, you know, kids like me, like a black kids, like just having these really fun adventures and, and doing these awesome things that I got to see all other kinds of kids having um, growing up. And I really wanted Go Squad to, to be that and to have that element um, to it. And 
to show that, you know, any kid can have adventures and save the day. That's oh. really so important for you to, for, for kids to see in ways that you can't even imagine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it's really funny because up until probably my thirties, I didn't like wearing my hair curly and I didn't understand why. Mm. And, and when I realized why it was like everything that I've ever watched or read, the main character who, who was a girl was always beautiful with straight blonde hair and blue eyes. And I really internalized that in a way yeah. that I could not unpack until I was older. Right. And um, yeah, kids don't care who they're reading about, but it does still affect them in, in, right. in, in negative and positive ways. So I think that if we let themselves see themselves in books then they don't have to wish that they were somebody else, mm. you know? Mm. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Oh, good. Go, go. Oh, Here we go. All right, brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, Claire, uh, you, you brought it up and I just wanted to, to, you know, kind of gauge what your experience was. How far away from your house were you allowed to play? Mm. Hmm. So it, it depended. Um, both on what neighborhood I was living in at the time and if I had like an older sibling with me. So when I lived in Hunts Point, I wasn't allowed to go anywhere without uh, either my parents or an older sibling. And we can only play, go as far as the park that was like two blocks away. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I moved to like Commonwealth Soundview area, which is like slightly safer neighborhood, I could go across the street. <laughs> <laughs> by myself, by myself. Um, and I could ride my bike with my brother to, like all the way to our church, which was like maybe like six blocks away. Mm -hmm. So it was like a little upgrade. Um, but in terms of by myself, I usually could only play in front of my house or mm -hmm. across the street and that's it. And my mom had to be able to see me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a, I have, I have a big sister <laughs> who's a writer too. Actually. <laughs> yeah. um, when I was growing up, I had her in the past tense. I still have her now. Anyway, um, we would go, we could go to parks that were kind of in like the couple blocks range. Um, we grew up in a part of Boston that had a very strong <laughs> mafia presence, <laughs> Irish mafia specifically. <laughs> so, okay. you know, they didn't know what to do with us. We just, we just weren't them. So they couldn't figure out which like racial slur to call us. Um, mm -hmm. so, like the kids, these were the actual mafiosos, I think. But, um, you know, so we, we would sometimes like run. And, <laughs> but in general, like, you know, it was kind of like, you just sort of know what parts to go to. And yeah. Um, mm -hmm. As I got older and I was more in like the YA years, I did used to bike around Boston a lot. And, and that was kind of my safe haven. And I, and I would often end up in uh, North End, um, which is like the Italian part of Boston and, uh, and like by the harbor and everything. And that was like, just a, a place where I found a lot of peace for whatever reason. But um, but as a kid kid, yeah, it was, you know, it was the immediate area with the parks around the house. Mm -hmm. How about you, man? Oh, I couldn't leave the block. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just, and not even like, uh, um, like go around the block. It was just like that one, the street where the house was on, it was like mm -hmm. up, up and right. down, that was it. Now, luckily uh, at the end of the street, um, there was, um, uh, a school, a small, tiny school, and they had a field and they had basketball courts. So like, like it wasn't like we didn't have anything to do. Like we can go down there and play, we could bike or whatever. Um, and, but yeah, no, it was no, there was no leaving that block at all. Mm. Don't, get, don't, don't get caught. Uh, Relatable. We, we had a corn. We had a corner store on right on my block, which was really lucky because I was allowed to like go buy honey buns, which is like, mm -hmm. my favorite thing mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I was timed. I was timed. Right. Like you go get the twenty five cent juice mm -hmm. and the honey bun, and you come home. Better not be a line. <laughs> better not be a line. Um. So, what do you guys like about writing middle grade specifically? Kwame, I don't know if you write YA also, but Daniel, you write YA and adult also. What do you like about middle grade? Uh, for me, I, I uh, recognized as I was starting to think about what a middle grade would be like for that I would write, um, I was tapping very intentionally into 11 year old me. And I was pretty cool at 11. I didn't necessarily <laughs> know it at the time. Uh, you know, I was a big nerd, obviously. <laughs> Everything has changed. I'm now a bigger nerd. And um, I had huge glasses and a big mop of hair. And, um, you know, I was a mess. 
and <laughs> and I loved uh, Star Wars and fantasy, and randomly I also loved, still do politics, and um, like I was obsessed with Watergate, you know, and llamas. So. <clears throat> Uh, all that to say is, I, I, you know, I, I was also just thinking of like the very energetic and excited 11 year old that I was. And I was trying to tell a story that I would have enjoyed back then. So I think a lot in terms of rhythm, if that makes sense, and I apologize for the construction happening right next door. Um, <laughs> I think a lot in terms of rhythm. So whereas like um, with Shadow Shaper with my YA, it, um, um, giving the characters a little more time to sort of stop and process their stuff and go internal and you know have moments you know in front of the mirror with each other um a lot of the a lot of dr hill squad is really forward driving adventure and they do process stuff because there's heavy things happening but they do it while they're still on the pterodactyl dodging bullets <laughs> and other things you know and that's a i i, I want to say that that's a very personal choice for what i was trying to do with my particular middle grade you know i love that one of the things I love the most about middle grade is that there are very quiet ones and there are very differently paced ones and ones that speak to kids, you know, who weren't me <laughs> at 11. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so that's really where I was at about it. It was like a little more um, of a sugar rush and a little more caffeine. And that's what it is. All right. You want to jump uh, into questions? Uh, yeah, we probably yeah, should. Oh, 10 minutes. We're, yeah, sure. Yep. Um, I don't know if they're choosing the questions or we are. Oh, they are. There, it is. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I agree that having, so Laura Ochoa says, I agree that having that visual of true POC characters on the cover is important. Same with Shadow Shaper covers with Sierra. How involved were you with those covers? First of all, if you guys had that moment where you go to a school visit and the first question that they can't wait to get out is, how did you draw the cover? <laughs> and you're like, oh, sweet all the time. I know uh, that wasn't- Imagine, know that wasn't imagine that being Laura. able to draw. I know, I know Laura wasn't asking that, but I, it always cracks me up because it's like the farthest thing from the truth. But I will say that uh, Scholastic has always been really, really above and beyond with me mm. in terms of involving me. With Shadow Shaper, it was, remember, first time author, I don't think they contractually had any obligation to check in with me. They brought me different possible um, models that they were going to use for Sierra to make sure that they had the right person. And and like that's very rare. Um, and, and I really was like blessed and, and privileged to have that opportunity. And then they nailed it exactly right the first time. Like they, they sent me the cover and it was perfect. Um, and, so cool. and the model, um, Zephora Nure, is a really great... Uh, advocate of the book, she really is, like, lo loves the books and everything. But anyway, so yeah, I think it's 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 a little rare. Um, hopefully, it's more more common that writers get some say in it. Um, mm -hmm. I have been able to have a lot of say. Nyla Magruder does the covers for the Dactyl Hill Squad books, and she's really amazing. And we we I we work closely together, um, partially because I love her work so much, and just because you know it works out. Um, for me, it was the same thing. I got. It was really collaborative. We made, I made a Pinterest board. They had me do a Pinterest board with like other covers that I really liked. And then um, my editor came back with some illustrators that he really liked. And we both loved Lorena Alvarez, who is the person who ended up doing the Ghost Squad covers. Really, That's really beautiful. I love that um, we wanted it to feel almost like the Coco poster, like glow in the dark, really bright colors and I think she did an amazing job and um yeah she she we did like two passes basically for it that I was part of and they they were incredible and I, I really love the cover I got and you, lucky and you put me on it yeah that's <laughs> that's Daniel <laughs> Kwame, how about you? I love your cover so uh, much. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Disney and Eric Wilkerson, the cover artist, did a fantastic job. My only, the only thing I told them, you know, they they asked me like, "Hey, is there a scene from the book that you, um, you know, really really spoke to you?" Um, and this is one where John Henry and Tristan are back to back fighting iron monsters to defend um, uh, some refugees hiding in the thicket. And um, uh, they just did a fantastic job. The only thing I said is I wanted, you know, a curly haired black boy on the cover with a hoodie. Mm -hmm. And Disney, uh, Tyler, the, the uh, uh, design director, art director, and uh, Eric Wilkerson collaborated and did an absolutely fantastic job. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really great. Um, so I think we have another question about, I don't know if they're gonna put it on screen or not, about riding dinosaurs. Um, so Lily yeah. Trumbullcan, she, yeah. Have you ever wanted to yeah. ride a dinosaur? Every day of my <laughs> life. No. I, I would oh, come be on. afraid. No. I would be afraid. But if the opportunity presented itself, I'm not going to say no. Like, no. Exactly. And you, Kwame, we all know you would no. be on that rock. No, road. no. Do you know how big a dime? No, no. Yes. With a saddle? <laughs> I mean, you want to ride a horse. No. Like, it's. No. I'm good. Horses, I would horses are suspicious, though. I feel like I understand not wanting to to ride a horse, but wanting to ride a dinosaur. Mm, thank you. Mm. Pterodactyls. I, yeah. I, I should say, pterodactyls are technically not dinosaurs. They're pterosaurs, but I would also want to ride one of those. I wish you the Nerd. best. <laughs> I, I will bring you with me. You'll wave from the ground. <laughs> All right, I think this is our last question. Um, it's a short panel. So um, McKenna Crossier wants to know, what is the thought process? How do you incorporate history and mythology into a fictional book? What are some ways to connect the present to the past myths without boring the audience? Oh, what a great question. That's a whole really good. Panel. We need a whole panel it to talk is. about that. That's a really good question. Uh, Jeez, McKenna, way to be a genius. I know. Um, That's great. Uh, I Go mean, ahead. we talked a little bit about the folklore that I created. Um, I think for me, it, the story had to be more than just that, you know, like mm -hmm. there, there are different elements to it. Like there's the friendship, um, and there's the funny moments and there's adventure. Like a story can't just be one note. You have to have right. a lot of layers to it, um, yeah. in order to not bore people because people do have short attention spans. So, um, for me, I just wanted to make sure that it really felt like you were along on an adventure with these two best friends, almost like you were the third best friend. Maybe you were Chunk in the bike basket, just listening to everything that was, that was, that was <laughs> Daniel was Chunk all along. Um, but yeah, that that was that's how I tried not to bore people. And I hope that um, I succeeded. I didn't bore Daniel, at least. He not at all. You, you gave me insomnia. <laughs> um, <laughs> for me, it's like, um, it's a really great question. It's something I thought a lot about, both in writing Dactyl Hill and Shadow Everything I write, I think about that very question because that's our job, right? Um, but especially with Dactyl Hill, where it's like, you know, as much as I love reading about history and I get really obsessed with history, I know that's not true of everybody, um, but what the idea of this whole series was to, like Kwame was talking about, make history really exciting for, for young people and make them, you know, to the point where they go and look up other stuff. And that's why every Dactyl Hill Squad book has a section in the back where it talks about what's real, what's made up, you know, wh where are further resources where you can go look up different things that were interesting to you. Um, but I think this is where it's important to think about how there's, there's an idea and then there's a story and they're different things. And we probably all had the experience of seeing a movie or reading a book that's just an idea and it puts you to sleep. And that's part of why um, stories really do matter and not just cool ideas. So, you know, the next step, once you have a cool idea is to be like, okay, what's at the heart of this and how does it turn into a story? And the answer, uh, the next question you have to ask yourself then is what is the conflict? Because the conflict is really gonna be at the heart of whatever that story is. What's the turning point? What matters and what changed over the course of that story? Um, those are the things that really um, come into play and I think make books exciting for people to read. Um, so that's what I was, so, you know, with Magdalise, it was like she's living in a time when there are dinosaurs and there's a whole war going on. And it, it turned out to be very easy actually to find, go figure, horrible people in American history who could uh, be the, perform the role of the bad guy in the story and uh, be, you know, posing a threat to Magdalise and her friends. And we sort of went from there. We have one minute left hey so, so Kwame do you want to answer really quickly yeah um, well, you know my 15 second blurb would be you know, <laughs> uh, history uh, for me history different parts of history there you'll find monsters everywhere right and it's how do we make those monsters oh. relevant from you know from that time to this time and what is scary about them and, you know, in Tristan, whether it's the iron monsters, whether it's the brand flies, whether it's the Ma'afa, which is the specter of something that happened in the past, mm -hmm. it's all about what is scary because scary transcends time. Mm. What, is, what was scary a hundred years ago might likely be scary today. That was a good answer, man. 
<laughs> well, <laughs> <you> know. <laughs> right. Uh, Thank you everyone for coming to the uh, Dinosaurs, Ghosts, and Gods Oh My panel. Please uh, make sure to pick up our books. Thank you so much to our interpreter, uh, Brian, again. Thank you, Brian. You've Thank been you. so great. Thanks everyone for coming.